And man, it went on Netflix, dude, and it just fucking exploded. It was like it was brand fucking new, man. Right. So the first two weeks it was on Netflix, it's, it's like top 10 on Netflix, not top 10 documentaries, like top 10 movie, series, Overall, everything yeah. for two weeks straight. Hey, we're back with Seth Ferranti. We're going to talk about what he did when he was in prison, which is interesting because it's a, it's basically he's in the position right now that I'm hoping to be in, in a few years. And we actually have a very similar prison experience. Um, so, yeah. So uh, basically, here's the thing. It's, you know, I've mentioned this before. It's like, you know, I started writing true crime stories when I was in prison. Uh, I didn't write any fiction stories. Like I've heard your... Your, how you started writing it's like some of the gangster guy stories and and uh, and some uh, some were of what fiction kind of fiction started no, that way no everything was pretty much non fiction my first book okay. prison stories was true but I wrote it as fiction because you know I didn't want to be like a snitch in right. prison right and everybody so they're always so worried about oh what if I tell you something that I could get well then well, let's not talk about that or we'll change yeah. the names but so yeah I, I started doing that I was say, it was the same thing like I I heard your interview before so. It's so basically like, look, I'm in prison, and what, when I was in prison, I saw all the other guys, they're learning to play an instrument, they're taking horticulture classes, uh, or they're, they're, they're playing softball, and it's like you're spending 10 years of your life, or 15 years, and you're an amazing you know, handball player, but, when you, but you came in with no education, you've only sold drugs, you know, you're an amazing handball player when you get out, but you're you're in your 50s now. The fuck mm. are you going to do when you get out of prison? None of and the guys that were taking horticulture are only concerned about taking it because they plan on buying, burning a bunch of houses and growing marijuana. And the guys that are taking the stuff as far as like um, I forget what they called that class where it was basically about how to run a restaurant. So highest failure rate out there. Get a restaurant. So what you want to do is you want to put a guy who has no money in a situation where he can open a restaurant. And fail. Or real estate. Or real estate or something. It's like you don't have any experience. You have no way to do this. So my point is, to me, I thought, what can I do in here? And the one, you can't really work, but the one thing they, they will let you do is they will let you write. They will let you publish books. They will let you write stories. You can write for magazines. And you can make money that way. You can't run a business, but they can't stop you from doing That's the one thing they will let you do. And there were so many amazing stories. I would hear guys tell stories. I heard for years, I'd listen to stories and I'd think, how is that not a movie? How has no one written your story? And they can't write their own stories because you don't see yourself the way you really are. Yeah. So that's when I came in, I wrote my own story and then I started writing other guys' stories. And, you know, I hope, I figured someday I'll get out of prison. I'll have all these stories and I'll try and get them turned into documentaries or IP. movies. IP. IP. I started collecting IP. And, so, but you, you know, but you're way ahead of where I am. I just like to be where you're at, at some point in the future. That's my, like my goal. That's like, that's my dream. That's what I laid in bed at night in my bunk and thought, well, if I get out, I could do this and I could do this and I do this. And I had a whole building block in my head, you know, planned. Yeah. You got well, that's how you do it. You got to manifest it. You got to talk about it. You got to put it out there. You got to make it reality. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, you know, um, like moving forward, positivity, and just saying what I'm going to do and then doing it. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. Like, I don't, like even in prison, prison is a very negative place, right? And when I first started writing, you know, even the guards, the other prisoners, they'd be like, you know, you can't do that. They'd always told me, like, I can't do this. And like, I would read the policy and I'd be like, man, I can do this. Yeah. You know, so, and so even out here, I'm like, I will not, I cannot stand negativity Anybody that is like negative or like second guesses me what I'm trying to do. And like, like I say, sometimes like, you know, I'm, I'm doing these documentaries now, you know, I got white boy on Netflix and you know, some people that might be like the pinnacle, but to me, it's just, it's just like, like another ladder on the rung. You know, I tell, I want to be the Quint, the next Quentin Tarantino. I want to do, you know, scripted, you know, fiction, fictional, like drug you know, crime movies, you know, or sometimes maybe based on a real event, but uh, you know, like, dude, like I want to do like hundred million dollar budget movies. Right. You know, like I'm not fucking around. Like I'm, I'm already looking right now from do this documentary stuff. I'm looking to jump to like the three to $5 million indie flick. And then, you know, then I'm looking to jump to like a 20 million, you know, 50, 60. And then, you know, I want to do like a fucking Marvel movie. Right. 
I want to do the purple man. I don't know if you know who the purple man is. He's a, he's this criminal character. He's like in a lot of Spider-Man comic books, but he's like, he wears like a gangster suit and he's all purple and he has like these, uh, I don't even know how to say it. It's like, is it called fur, fur gnomes or something? So it's like he can emit from his body. Pheromones, 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 pheromones. So he can permit, he can emit those from his body and make you do what he says. So that's like his superpower, but he's like had, a villain. I had an ex-girlfriend like that. Yeah. A lot, I think a lot of women are like that, <laughs> especially on men. But, uh, so, but he's like a super villain. So I want to do like the purple man movie. You know, I also want to do, uh, I want to remake the princess bride. Right. Oh, nice. Nice. You know I saying? love the. You guys don't even know what the princess bride. I want to remake it's the princess bride. So sad, bro. With like, with, with good CGI. Nice. You know, like a Tolkienistic version of the Princess Bride, but keep the humor and the sweetness. And then uh, another movie I want to remake. I want to remake, uh, you know, Harder They Come. You know, the, the the classic or Harder They Fall, the classic Jamaican movie. Okay. Yeah. So it's like from 1971. You know, it's about uh, you know Jimmy Cliff's in it. So he's about like a, a, a up and coming reggae, you know, dance hall guy, but like he's involved in crime. So I want to remake that just like think how they remade Scarface. Right. So I want to remake, uh, you know, that old Jamaican movie, except, you know, set it in like the, you know, the hip hop era, you know, and, and have a guy who's like, he's trying to be a rapper, but he's involved in crime and he ends up, you know, going to jail for being a crime. Like a lot of the stories we, uh, you know, heard about in federal prison, but, um, yeah, my whole thing, man, why I started writing, cause I, I kind of looked at, it. I started taking college classes and I was like, when you were in prison. Yeah, yeah, when I was which in is, prison. Which is difficult, by the way. Like, everybody thinks that, oh, yeah, they offer this. They offer, Listen, man, you basically, you're doing everything yourself. There's, yeah. They might have some person who's supposed to help you, but they're half-assed about yeah. it. So it's and basically plus, all on you. And plus, when I first went in, they had the Pell Grants, right? But by 96, they, they abolished yeah. the Pell Grants, so they didn't even fund the college courses. So my parents paid for all my college courses. I did all my shit correspondence. So I got the AA degree from Penn State. I got the BA from bachelor, or from uh, University of Iowa. And actually, that, that was one of my best moves when I got in that program because University of Iowa is like famous for this a writing program. You know, you got to the writing program. You got to go there. You know, it's like on campus. But a lot of the instructors that I was doing correspondence courses through were the instructors from that famous writing course, you know, doing like extra work for extra money. Right. And so I, I had the benefit of these instructors and I was taking all writing heavy because in there you can go like a business administrative route or you can go like a humanities route. You know, and if you go like a humanities liberal arts, it's like a lot of writing, creative writing, journalism, you know, reading a lot of books and writing papers. And, um, Eventually, I got my master's degree. I got my master's degree from uh, University of California. So, um, but during that whole time, that that's how I learned to write. You know, so it's not like I just started putting pen to paper or whatever. I like took college courses, you know, and I learned to write. I already was creative. You know, I, I was kind of creative, you know, my whole life. You know, I used to write poetry, play in bands, all that shit like that. You know, I was like dungeon master. Right. You know what I'm saying? Creating all these worlds <laughs> and shit. It's so yeah. funny. Like, they don't know. Yeah. They don't know what that means. Yeah. What a so, dungeon uh, master is. Dungeons and dragons. That was like the. Oh, yeah. no, wow. Yeah. Listen, there's so many things. There's so many things that people, I'll say to 80s. somebody my age, and I'll always look over at Colby, and Colby's just like, he has no clue what I'm yeah. talking about. That's the 80s shit. The, eight, it's good it, stuff. the 80s was a wonderful time. But pre-internet was, I think it was a better world, really. But, uh, you know, so the whole time I'm getting these degrees, I, I'm, I'm writing. So first I started writing, I, I, my first big success was actually writing prison basketball. So, you know, because like, like in there, dude, there's like these dudes, they're like phenomenal basketball players, yeah. dude. And, like, and like, like how you're talking about, like they spend all this time, they spend like 10, 15 years just playing basketball. But, you know, I mean, they can never be professional because they're when they get out, they're going to be too old. But like in there, dude, like these dudes are phenomenal basketball players. So I started writing about this one guy named Ron Jordan. He was from Harlem. He had like that Rucker Park game, dude. And this dude was built like a, a linebacker, right? He was maybe like 6'1", like 240. Right. But this dude could like slam dunk. He had like all the handles. He like embarrassed dudes. They, they call him Ron Jordan, the abuser, because he used to like abuse people. He would like do all the stuff, like fake somebody out, act like he's going to the bas basket and with the easy layup. But he would pull it back to let the dude guard him again. You know, because it, it was just like the, the, the man on man, like macho shit, dude, this dude. And he could dunk and he could shoot threes. This dude was scoring like 60 points a game. 
And everybody used to come out to the gym to see him. So that was like my first big success. I started writing about this dude and the other prison basketball players. And um, yeah, I was writing for this website called Hoops Hype, you know, which now they're, they're like on, I don't know, they're like, uh, I think USA Today or something bottom. So they're like this big, but that time they were just like this little uh, kind of hip hop, right. you know, a uh, hip hop basketball website. And then I started writing for Slam, which is kind of like a hip hop basketball magazine. And then from there, I started doing the more gangster stories. I started writing for Don Diva and Feds, which are like they call like you know the the street the street Bibles. Yeah, yeah they wouldn't even let, they wouldn't yeah. even let those into the like those are prison. like the most popular magazines in yeah. prison. Man, like guys would get them sent in. They'd have the have the they start, started alternate putting alternate covers. Yeah, yeah new fake covers. covers, like, covers yeah, yeah, fake covers to get like them you in. get one of those magazines in prison. Like like dude, the line is like two hundred long. Yeah. Everybody wants to read it. You know, so um. I started writing for them, uh, Don Diva, Feds, and um, really, I, 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 I formed a journalism uh, career in prison because yeah. that was like the only thing I could do. I was like, what the fuck can I do? I was like, I can write, you know? So, um, and then really, my biggest break came, um, this is probably like early 2000s. I just started writing re really like around 99. So, uh, you know, at first I was just writing like in the prison, like I was doing prison sports newsletters, like that they post on the boards and yeah, stuff. Yeah. I, I was doing that. I did that for six years while I was taking the college classes. So then I started doing the Don Diva stuff and the prison basketball. And then uh, there was this editor at Vice named Jesse Pearson. So this was like when Vice was just basically a magazine. They had a website, but they weren't huge like they are today. So this right. is like early 2000s. You know, so they're like this kind of low rent GQ. You know, they have this big thing. It's like do's and don'ts where they do like the fashion, like dress like this. And they make fun of people. They take pictures. So he had he was a big fan of my work from Don Diva. So he reached out to me, you know, and um, I started writing, dude, dude. And they were paying me like, dude, they were paying me like five hundred dollars a month. Right. To write a column. I wrote a column, like 1,200 words called I'm Busted. And it was in every magazine for like fucking two or three years. $500. Like I was living like a yeah. king on yeah. 500 a month. 500 bucks in prison's a lot of fucking Fuck, money. Fuck, dude. I was like, everybody thought I was like a millionaire. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so that was like my first big break because I started writing for that. And then uh, I kept for, I kept writing for Vice as they kept growing. And I, kept, I was like their prison guy. You know, I would do like their prison. And then I got more into true crime. Then I started doing stuff for Penthouse. I started doing stuff for The Fix, War on Drug stuff. And um, how the whole white boy thing came about is, uh, you know, I started writing him around 2005 because I, I started doing my Street Legends stuff. Like I had all this material from Don Diva. And Don Diva could only, it's a magazine, so they could only fit like so much. And I had all this extra material. And I like all the dudes, they kept coming back to me. They're like, dude, what about this picture? Or what about this? You want to use some of the stuff? So eventually, you know, like they were upset with me because everything was not in the magazine that they gave me. You know, so eventually I came up with my Street Legends series. I've published uh, Prison Stories 2005, Street Legends 2008. So... At the same time, um, I reach out to White Boy Rick because I'm in FCI Gilmer and Beckley, Beckley, FCI Beckley and FCI, FCI Gilmer in West Virginia. And there's all these Detroit dudes. So I'm hearing about this dude, White Boy Rick. Hold on. You know who White Boy Rick is? I, okay. I, you guys I, saw I, the, the movie. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it, but I've seen the trailers and stuff. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I start writing him because I want to put him in like my Street Legends book. Yeah. Right. And, and basically my Street Legends books are just like all these uh, African-American drug lords that are, are part of, uh, you know, the lyrical lore of hip hop. Right. You know, and gangster rap. I, I kind of uh, I just kind of romanticize and glorify it and I make them into these Billy the Kid, you know, Jesse James yeah, yeah. type figures. Because, you know, I was writing I was writing for my peers in prison and also. I was a white guy writing about African American dudes like in prison. Like, you know, that doesn't happen. I mean, you've been yeah, in prison. Yeah. That's not like that's not like something normal, you no. know? And and the only reason I even had the juice to do that is because, you know, I had the long sentence. I, I'd been in a little bit, and you know, the longer you're in, the more stripes you get. Yeah, yeah. You know? So um, by the time I do this, you know, I'm like in ten years. So, you know, I got I got a lot of stripes and I played sports. I was I was a sports fanatic. I'm like really athletic. I would be like the only white dude like out there playing ball with all the black dudes. Like yeah. like I would I was like the dude. Like you know you go to the yard. Like you go to the yard at lunch. I'm playing ball. You go to the yard at recall. I'm playing ball. Yeah. You know I played like three hours straight. I didn't give a fuck. That was like how I did my time. Yeah. I I actually sat at a table in the library with five guys that were writing, uh, five black guys that were all writing um, urban novels. I was the only one writing true crime. But I, and I was the white guy at the room or at the table because I was the guy that you know, as racist as this is going to sound, it was it was basically you don't have Google, 
what you've got is a white guy. So they'd say, you know, I don't understand. How do you say that? Hey, Cox. It was always, hey, Cox. Hey, Cox. And I'd be like, no, it's this. It's that. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, this. Yeah. So, I mean, I was, you know, to sit at that table, everybody thought I was like a, you know, like, you must be a cool guy to be sitting at the table with all those guys because the white, the white guys and black guys very seldomly mix in person. You were just Google. Yeah, I was Google. Yeah, I had a, I had a purpose. You were like that smart guy from the 80s that, that Google fucking yeah. made obsolete. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In prison, only in prison. You know. Yeah, but in prison, like, they still I'm, need that guy, that guy who knows everything. Out here, I'm semi-smart, but yeah. in prison, fucking super genius in prison because the IQ is so low. But yeah. anyway. No, that's what that's what I, I tell people too, right? Because look, like since I've been out, like, dude, I, I've been to Cannes, man. I go to Sundance and I'm around like, dude, these people, they went to Harvard and Columbia and dude, they just speak. And I'm like, I just want to be around them so I can learn to speak better because they're like so eloquent and they use all these fucking big words. And like, like I, I feel like a brute around them, right? Yeah. But like in prison, I'm like, like you said, I'm like the super genius in fucking prison. And then I get out around all these fucking talented writers and filmmakers and people that went to all these Ivy League schools and come from all this money. And I just, I feel like a fucking brute, dude. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's, it's fucking crazy. This, this is like my, my, my biggest fucking dilemma today, you know, because a lot of people that are like, oh, no, you're eloquent. You can talk. And I'm like, no, I don't talk like that. I'm a fucking, I talk like a brute. Right. I talk like an educated brute. Yeah, That's I, yeah I kind among of talk my about. friends on the outside, I'm like a, I, I'm practically a thug around these guys. And to me, it's like, as far as like masculinity, like I always say, like I'm, I'm like a four or five on the masculinity scale from one to one. To, one oh to yeah. Ten. There's some tough dudes right. in prison. But they in got prison, tough motherfuckers. Oh, in prison, yeah. I'm like a one, maybe yeah, a zero. Yeah, I yeah. might as well be wearing a dress when I'm in yeah, prison. Yeah, Out yeah. here, I'm a five. Prison, yeah. I'm a zero practically. Yeah. I'm, I'm this far from being a fucking punk in prison. I mean, that's how they look yeah. at you. You're a soft white guy. You're, you're harmless. Yeah. But yeah, it's funny how just everything changes out here. Yeah. So, so, you know, so white, white boy Rick, I started writing him, right? And like, I want to tell his story, right? But I want to like romance, romanticize it. I want to make it gangster. You know, I want to glorify it because that's what I'm doing in my Street Legend right. series. And that's, I'm hearing these, all this stuff about him. Like, who is this white kid that was running all these, you know, black organized crime in Detroit when he was like 16 or 17? And I kind of identify him with him too, you know, because we were both young white dudes. We both got a lot of time. You know, we were both involved in stuff as a teenager. So, you know, there's a lot of similarities, you know, so I'm writing him and we start writing and he starts telling me like this totally opposite story. You know, how like he was in a foreman and, you know, the police prostituted him and buried him. And, and I, I didn't really get it at first. Cause I'm like, I'm like, man, I don't, I don't, I'm not writing about informants. Like my, my base is like the other prisoners, you know, and I'm in like yeah. medium security prisons. I'm like, these dudes ain't going to fucking, if I write some shit, they're going to be like, you're writing about a snitch, you know, or whatever. So it, it, it took me a couple years to kind of get my head around his story and, and, and how to write it. And like I say, it took me to get older and it took my writing to evolve and it probably took me going to a low. Yeah. Where, you know, they don't carry it like the same, you know, because I did 12 years in the mediums and then I did nine years in the lows. So it was like this kind of evolution in my writing where, you know, I went from writing this hardcore death before dishonor shit to, uh, you know, more about the injustices of the drug war. Because I started seeing the bigger picture more, you know, as I got older and I started writing more. And, and like I say, also going to the low gave me more room to explore this stuff with not being considered this or be considered that. So, um. Yeah, 2012, I wrote this story about his case for the fix, dude. And, like, the shit fucking went viral, dude. Like, it was my first experience of having... The prison basketball shit was pretty popular. But, like, this shit, like, fucking went super fucking viral on the fix. This is a, like, drug war fucking site. Right. And um, just brought a ton of attention to me, you know. And um, the whole time I was already thinking, you know, because I was writing books, uh, you know, from 2005 till I got on 2015... I wrote eight books, and um, then when I got out, I took two of those books and I divided it up the chapters, you know, and, and put twelve out like digital books, you know, to make it like twenty, even though it's like from the same material. And then I had a couple more, so I think I got like twenty four books out right now. But once I started doing the books, you know, and, and I was kind of doing the journalism, and I was like, man, really, I want I want to do movies, I want to do visual stuff, you know. Um, but it was just kind of you know, learn it. And like when I took my master's degree, I took like a lot of film type courses, you know, at least reading the books as much right. as I could in there. And I, I did have a couple, like they would let me send in some DVDs, you know, so I could watch different shit. But, uh, 
really like everything I was doing, man, was basically for gearing up, you know? So, you know, I even like, dude, I read a whole bunch of books, like, like books on like shots, like that explains all the different shots, like in narratives and stuff like that. And yeah, I just went crazy. So I was like, you know, reading, because in there, that's all you got time to do yeah. is read. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you might as well educate yourself. I don't think I don't think I read five books since I've been out in six years. But you know, um, yeah. So I kind of hit the ground running, and um, you know, I did more pieces on White Boy Rick's story for like Vice News and Vice and some other places. So, um, but the, still, when I first got out, though, I was just a journalist. I was working as a journalist, and then I met the dude Sean Reck, the director of White Boy. And he had Transition Studios. He had just done this movie, A Murder in the Park. It was on Showtime. And I actually interviewed him for that, for that, for Vice. Right. And he found out about my backstory, and we started talking. And at first, we were going to do, like, this uh, prison expose, like, on, on, on how all these sub-industries are built around the prisons. Right. You know, like, like Keefe Coffee yeah, yeah, yeah. and all the hotels and how it's all kind of interconnected. You know, with the the dude, like the senator brings the prisons there and it's all his friends, the businessmen who form all the businesses around the prison. So we were looking at something like that and then we were talking and uh, I showed him some, it was like right when they announced like the White Boy Rick movie with Matthew McConaughey and I had shown him some of my articles. I go, did you hear about this? And he's like, yeah, I heard they're going to do that movie. And I'm like, you know, I know this dude. And I'm like, check out, here's these articles. You know, I wrote like four or five articles about, and he's like, what? He's like, he's from Cleveland. So he's like, yeah, I heard about this dude. You know, he's like our age. So he's like, I heard about this dude, man. And uh, then he was like, man, he was like, you got access to him? And I was like, yeah. He's like, I'm looking to do my next doc, man. Let's do this. You know, so it was just like lucky I made the right relationship at the right time when he was looking for something, you know, and it, there was a hype because of the White Boy Rick movie. Right. So it made him interested. And um, for that, he actually he had actually, you know, told me like he came with a couple different proposals like, you know, let's do it like this. Let's do it like this, you know, trying to lessen, you know, maybe kind of my role or just kind of, you know buy the idea or whatever. And, right. I, and I told him, you know, I knew how to tell a story, but I didn't really know how to make a film. So I told him, I said, look, man, I said, you know, I want, I want to be by your side. You know, I want you, you know, whatever, if you can give me something at the end, whatever, but you don't got to pay me nothing. Now I say, I want to, you know, keep by, I want you to mentor me. Also, I asked him that because this dude had cut his teeth doing like Crime Stoppers. He did like 200 Crime Stopper shows you for all the networks. Yeah. And he had won like nine regional Emmys in Ohio for all his work on these 200 shows. So I knew dude was something special. I knew he knew what he was doing because when I walked in his office, he had nine fucking Emmys. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, man. So I made the deal with him. I said, look, dude, I'm, I'm going to get you everything you need for this film. I'm going to get you all the access. I'm going to get you all the, the people you need to make this film. And I go, I just want you to, uh, you know, involve me in the process, man. And, and he, he was very fucking cool about it. So like a lot of times we would do the interviews and I would be there sometimes. I might watch the camera, sometimes not. But always at the end of the interview, when he was done, he would give me five minutes in the director's chair. So, you know, actually, white boy, so I, I, I got a, a, write, a, a writer credit and a producer credit on that. And Sean Reck, an Emmy-winning director, trained me how to be a director. You know, mentored me over that, like, you know, nine to 12 months that we did the shooting. You know, and then I worked with his editor, you know, and him as we edited it, you know, over, over like the next nine to 12 months. So that was like, uh, you know, so really, I mean, Sean Reck, I mean, he, he taught me a lot. And then also like, like Rick, man, Rick's, Rick's still my real good friend to this day. You know, Rick, a lot, there was a lot of interest in Rick. He had the Hollywood movie, man. Rick didn't have to, you know, give us our blessing or, or right. participate in that, in that white boy documentary. He did that uh, because of our relationship. Cause I told him, cause I said, look, dude, I said, I want to make films. I said, this dude got the money to make this film. And I go, first off, you know, our first goal was to get him out. Yeah. You know, and he had got this other guy out from a murder in the park. Right. So that was kind of like his track record, but that was like the first thing. But I said, I told Rick, I said, the second thing is I want to make films, motherfucker. I said, do this for me. Cause you know, he was kind of first, he was like, ah, oh, who's this guy and his, his representation were, oh, we don't know about this guy. He only made this one film, who the fuck is he? But I told him, I said, look, I believe in this dude. I, I've seen his, you know, team, he can do it, you know? And I go, this is my entrance into the film world and what I want to do. And so like, I, I will always be indebted, you know, to Rick, especially, 
you know, for giving me that opportunity by giving his blessing to that, but also, you know, to Sean Reck for, right. for teaching me everything that he taught me. And it's on, it's on Netflix right now. Is it playing yeah. on Netflix? Yeah, it's on Netflix So it was right on, now. what was it on, before Discovery and then no, Netflix? No, it was on or Stars. It was on Stars for 18 months. And, and now then, Netflix. Yeah, then it went on Netflix. And it was crazy because when it first came out, it first came out probably like, uh, you know, almost three years ago. And um, when it first came out, I knew it was a good film, right? But this is like pre-pandemic. This is like uh, pre-Black Lives Matters exploding all over the uh, you know right. world internationally. You know, this is pre a lot of things. And I think when it first, I thought like everything that's happening now was going to happen when it first came out, man. Because I was like, man, this film is awesome, man. Sean Reck and his team. You know, I, I contributed to it, but you know, I'll give credit where credit is due. I mean, that was Sean Reck and his editor. You know, I was probably like the third most important person on that, or maybe the fourth. But uh. You know, I knew it was a good film. I knew it was powerful, and it did. It helped to get Rick out. You know, not that it got Rick out by itself, but it helped. But um, I thought everything that's happening now was going to happen then. But I think because the world, the way the world was, you know, people, you know, they didn't believe it, or, you know, there was too many rabbit holes, or they didn't believe in the level of corruption that we were showing and exposing, you know. And plus, I think everybody was still kind of in the rat race of America, you know, capitalism, trying to make money. So, um you know, so it had like a, you know, 18 month run on stars and, you know, it didn't really get a lot of recognition or turn a lot of heads. And then, you know, then like we, we signed the Netflix deal and um, it went on Netflix, like right at the end of the pandemic, you know, like last April. And I think it might have something to do with like the Tiger King effect maybe, but it, man, it went on Netflix, dude, and it just fucking exploded. It was like it was brand fucking new, man. Right. So the first two weeks it was on Netflix, it's, it's like top 10 on Netflix, not top 10 documentaries, like top 10 movies, series, Overall, everything yeah. for two weeks straight, right? New York Times did like a little fucking write up on it. And uh, then, you know, like, like I say, then like they said, like in April and May, like it had 20 million fucking views. Right. So it, it's crazy because that just, for me, it put a lot of wind in my sails because I had a bunch of different stuff I wanted to do that I'm working on now, but I didn't really have the money. Right. But it just kind of blew me up. And I always look at it like, I look at it like sports. Like, all right, New England Patriots won the Super Bowl. Everybody knows Tom Brady's a man, but all those other free agents on that team are getting big contracts. Yeah. So like I was part of something that was has been extremely successful you know, on Netflix and that a ton, and it's, it's like recognition, the, the recognition value, dude, like you could talk to anybody, you know, most people, they know fucking white boy Rick and they know fucking white boy on Netflix. Right. You know, it gives that, that recognition, like that name value where I do like, I could just meet somebody on the plane and be like, Oh yeah, I did white boy on Netflix. And they'd be like, you know, they, they know, know it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So now dude, I got a ton of shit, man. I'm, I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing a cannabis documentary cannabis docuseries on Humboldt County called Tangled Roots that I just uh, I just premiered the teaser at uh, the Emerald Cup which is like the World Series of Cannabis just last weekend you know I got on stage and got to talk about it I had all the farmers with me um, I'm doing an LSD docu docuseries that I'm gonna premiere the first episode of it in San Francisco on Bicycle Day you know that's like when Albert Hoffman that's like when Albert Hoffman first synthesized LSD and took it and discovered LSD they call it bicycle day on April 19th all right so i'm doing it at this uh this thing in San Francisco <clears throat> and then um i also got this other docu series i'm working on uh about the mafia and heroin called dope men and so i'm i'm making arrangements you know i've kind of come up with this plan cuz all this stuff i do it's 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 kind of niche it's kind of true crime um, it's really hard to get in the film festivals. You know, I've been going to all the big film festivals. I've been to Cannes. I've been to Sundance. You know, I've been talking to all these people. And um, I'm kind of seeing like these target uh, market audiences like the Emerald Cup or like an LSD specific event or like a mafia specific event. Right. Is These are almost like, like I, I think I can use these like my Sundance. You know, because I mean, you know, maybe I could get a Sundance, maybe not. But, you know, Sundance is only once a year and all my stuff's going to be finished up you know, like in the next six to eight months. So I'm, I'm looking for ways, like how can I create the hype, you know, in, in the press and make enough noise, you know, to make the streamers notice. Yeah, I got White Boy on Netflix, but it's not like I got a direct cook up to Netflix, you right. know? So you still got to, you got to make the noise. That's why they have the film festivals because, you know, they write about these things and that brings the attention of the Amazons, the Hulus, the Netflix. And really in today's game, it's not about going to the theater. It's not about going to DVD. It's about getting on these streamers, man. That's how, that's how you're going to make your money back and that, that's how you're going to keep working. And really... 
right. really like anything in life with film, it's, uh, you know, it's about, you got to keep working, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you, you, you got to get this stuff. Cause I mean, that shit's expensive. We spent like white boy costs like 250,000 to make. You know, and like some of these uh, docu series that, that I'm doing now, you know, that are like 180, 225 minutes. I mean, these are like, I mean, we're spending like, you know, five hundred, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to to complete these projects. Right. Hey, if you like the video, do me a favor and subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. Also, we're gonna have uh, any links that uh, link to um, to Seth's story or to anything that Seth wants me to put in the uh, description will be in the description. There'll be a bunch of links in there, hopefully. And uh, that's it. And I appreciate it. See ya.